And as we start this morning, I just wanted to, to start with a question. It's a question uh, that often runs through my own mind, and perhaps it runs through uh, your mind from time to time as well. I often wonder to myself, what is it that stops people uh, from becoming a Christian? Uh, why don't we see the good news of the gospel having more impact on our society and culture around us? Why are people seemingly so slow uh, to respond I suppose for many people in our world today, uh, the, the answer still remains that they, they just haven't heard about the good news of the gospel. Uh, no one has ever bothered to tell them who Jesus is and why he came. On the other hand, it could be that they've got such a, a distorted view of Christianity in the past uh, that they've never really uh, given it a second thought. But for those people who have, often uh, the, the, the attitude is, well, I can see that, that it all makes sense, but it's just not for me. Sometimes at the end of a, a Christianity Explore course or something uh, like that, that's the response you get uh, from those attending. I can see that the gospel makes sense, people will say. I can see that it's true, uh, but I'm not going to do anything about it. It's just not for me. And I think what lies behind that particular statement, and others like it, are two specific issues. And the first one is uh, that when people understand what the gospel is, uh, they realize that their lives will need to change in some sort of way. And that can really be quite threatening, can't it? Uh, what am I going to have to give up? What is God going to ask me to do? What kind of changes is he going to make in my life? And the second uh, thing that goes along with that is, what, what are my friends going to think about me? Uh, what about my family, uh, my mates at work, uh, those that I go to school with or I'm at college or university with? What, what reaction will they have to me becoming a Christian? In fact, that might be uh, what is stopping you from becoming a Christian uh, right now. You see, it's not until the, the good news really starts to sink in to our hearts and lives when we really come to understand just what Jesus has done for us and what he offers us and that that is so much greater than what this world around us can give us uh, that we will be willing to turn around and give our lives completely over to him. But even then, uh, those initial worries and concerns, they don't go away, do they? Even when uh, we've become a Christian, we all still have to work through these, these issues in our lives. And that's why Peter is writing this letter. It's because as Christians, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. Uh, we are to, to live in it, but we are not to be shaped by it. Uh, we are to live distinctively differently from those around about us. And that will sometimes bring real tension into our lives and relationships with other people, Peter says especially, as he writes here in chapter 4, uh, from those who are closest to us, from those who know us best. So what kind of tension is he talking about here? Well, let's just read from verse 1 uh, with a focus on verses 3 and 4. Uh, from verse 1, we read these words, Therefore, uh, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with the same attitude, because those who have suffered in their bodies have finished with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for he evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. And then verse 3. For you who have spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry, they are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living, and they heap abuse on you. Now we need to remember that at this particular time, these early Christians, they'd only just become believers, and so their old way of life would have still weighed very heavily in their minds, as would those old friends that they would have uh, hung out, out with, uh, not to mention those various establishments and, and all sorts of licentious behavior on offer uh, there. Uh, they would have still been situated around them. And the, the temptation to go back would have been very, very real and very, very strong, as would the pressure uh, to conform to those kind of things. Uh, perhaps you can imagine the, the first century Christian there in the office at the end of the day. What do you mean you're not coming out after work with us? Don't you want to have some fun? Come on, loosen up a little bit. I mean, don't you like us anymore? Do you think that you're better than us all of a sudden now that you've become a believer? 
And that's the kind of day-to-day suffering that these early Christians that Peter is writing to uh, were living under. It wasn't the the universal state-sponsored systematic persecution that we sometimes imagine, though that was to come just a few years later under Emperor Nero. It was that ridicule, that social exclusion that they received on a daily basis simply because they were Christians. As one author put it, they didn't face losing out, uh, they didn't face losing their lives every day, but they did face losing out every day which is very much like us isn't it we are very much like Peter's original readers but Peter urges them as he urges each one of us not to live that way anymore that is what you were he says but that's not how who you are now Christ has changed you I mean don't you think you've lived enough of your lives living that kind of way doing those sort of things isn't enough enough Peter says And then he goes on to list those various sins, which may have marked uh, their past life, but shouldn't mark the present life, and definitely not the future life. Uh, Sins like debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and idolatry. Once again, Peter, he wrote these words over 2,000 years ago, didn't he? And yet he could have been writing them today. With all our advances in technology, we really haven't come very far as a human race, have we? Those same sins that Peter says that these people should stay away from are the very same sins that we need to avoid today. Now, of course, there may well be some of us sitting here this morning, whether you're here in the building or perhaps on your sofa at home, who remember vividly what it was like to live without God in our lives, just like these early believers could. Uh, Perhaps you haven't been a Christian for very long, or perhaps you just have a very good memory of those things. Uh, For some of us, it was so long ago uh, that we really don't have any recollection of what it was like to live uh, without Christ in our lives. But if we had a lifestyle uh, that was anything like what Peter is describing here, then there's always that temptation, isn't there, to dabble back there again. Especially when the pressure is on, when times are hard, when we're feeling stressed and perhaps a little isolated. There is a tendency to want to go back to those things that used to comfort us in some way. But again, Peter says here, that stuff belongs to our old way of life. That's just not us anymore. We've moved beyond that. We've been called out of that way of life and to a new way of life, to a beautiful way of life. But again, there will still be those around us, whether it be our family, our friends, or our work colleagues, who will be surprised that we don't want to join them in in their reckless, wild living, as Peter uh, puts it here. And they will heap abuse on us. Uh, They might well accuse us of being a party pooper. Or maybe we'll earn an unwanted nickname. Or perhaps more than likely our friends will give us the cold shoulder and not include us in their plans. uh, Which can be really quite hurtful at times, can't it? They might, might even want to try and win us back and draw us back into those things that we did before. Maybe we've previously been involved in in lucrative, uh, slightly dodgy deals uh, with an unbelieving business partner. And yet now we must leave all that behind. And it's not that we stop being friends with these people. Uh, We are still called, aren't we, to engage with the world around us. We're not to isolate ourselves away from them. But there will be that constant tension uh, because uh, those places and those situations Uh, are things that we need to take a stand over. And we need to say, look, I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm certainly not trying to act holier than thou in this situation. The reason that that I can't do this or do that or go there, you know, it's got nothing to do with you, but it's got everything to do with me. I'm just trying to live a life where those things are in the past and not in the present. So how about we go to a Starbucks or a restaurant instead? For those of us who became a Christian, perhaps later on in life, I wonder what would it look like to meet up with some of those old friends uh, that we used to hang out with. For some of them, I know for some of my friends, uh, their, their jaws would drop. I think they'd drop even further knowing that I was a pastor now. However, that was the old way of life, wasn't it? That was the life we used to live. 
And since then, Christ has wonderfully saved us and he has begun to change us, to to make us more and more like him. And yet I think we need to bear in mind that we are increasingly, because of the current culture uh, we live in and the way that things are going in the world, this difference in lifestyle between us will become even more apparent as sex outside of marriage continues to be an accepted practice as various forms of sexuality are allowed, as moral laws against things like abortion and euthanasia are seemingly abolished. You know, if we hold on to uh, biblical truth, then we will face increasing hostility from from those around about us for, for what they perceive to be our outdated and narrow opinions. We live in a day, don't we, where it is offensive to follow Christ. And yet as believers, we need to be okay with that because we are called to live faithfully and reject that path of least resistance. So how do we do that? How do we live faithfully in light of those tensions and pressures that we face to conform? How do we swim against the flow? Well, Peter, in this letter, he tells us to do three things. And first of all, uh, he tells us to, to look forwards. And we see that there in in verse 5 and then a little later in verse 6 where he says, But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Uh, Peter is trying to encourage his Christian uh, readers here uh, because although the, the mocking might last a lifetime, in terms of eternity, it's really only temporary. And after we die, we will all be judged uh, for what we have said and done including those people around us who have heaped abuse on us and made fun of us and and said all sorts of things against us. And you know, God's righteous judgments in the future, it should matter far more to us than than the unrighteous judgments that people make about us in the here and now. Not just those uh, unjust uh, comments that are made to our face or to Facebook or behind our backs. Uh, Those things will hurt from time to time. Of course they will. But we need to know that, that we have... Uh, a hope that lasts beyond this life. And one day, justice will finally be served. And then Peter, he says something that that seems a little bit odd uh, when you first read it, uh, but it's really not. In verse 6, on the same theme, he says this, For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regards to the body, but live according to God in regards to the Spirit. As I said, that might at first read sound a little bit confusing to us, but it's actually a tremendous uh, gospel promise. You see, the first part of that verse, it doesn't mean that we're to preach to the dead. Uh, You can't be saved after you die. There's not some uh, place that you can go to in the sky where you can stay and be admitted to heaven a little bit later on because people on earth are praying for you. Uh, There's no purgatory in the Bible, as some believe. No, this verse means that we are to preach to the living whilst they are alive, so that when they die, having believed the gospel and put their faith and trust in Christ, they will go to heaven and not to hell. The world around us, it mocks us, doesn't it, uh, for following Christ. It doesn't quite understand why believers behave as they do. And yet, even after some of us die, people will, uh, will think that perhaps we've wasted our lives in some way. But the reality is that death is a great leveler, isn't it? It's the great leveler of the human race. Unless Jesus returns at first, we will all die. But not only is it the great leveler of the human race, it is also the great divider. Uh, The Bible says that we are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. First we die and then we face God in judgment. And these verses tell us that, that one day those judgments that people have made upon us in this life will one day be reversed. Those people who who seemingly got away with murder, will be brought to justice. Those who promoted casual sex will find their days of pleasure have come to an end. Those who have lived carelessly in this life will have to answer to Almighty God. 
But of course, that's only really one side of the coin, isn't it? The, ver- the, the reverse of that is also true. You know, husbands and wives who have uh, faithfully kept their wedding vows will be glad that they did. Those who have lost their jobs because they wouldn't compromise their faith are told that they will receive a hundredfold in return. Students who remain pure because of their commitment to Christ will see his smile. You know, when it feels like we're missing out in this life, and let's be honest, it sometimes does, doesn't it? It does seem like we're missing out sometimes. Sin sometimes looks so appealing. But when our friends ridicule us for our beliefs, when they call us killjoys for not joining in with them, let's remember that this life is not all there is. Those around us, they might live by the maxim, uh, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow uh, we die. But we know, don't we, that there is a life that lasts beyond uh, this one. And it will be so much better and so much longer in comparison. And that's what Peter gets fired up about as he circles round, as he makes his final approach, and as he looks to land this letter. Look forwards, he says. But then he goes on to say, look inwards. I wonder, what would you do if you knew that the world would end in 24 hours' time? How would you spend your last day here on earth? What would you do? Who would you see? How would you behave? Well, in verses 7 to 11, Peter begins by reminding us that, all, that, that the end of all things is near, which simply means that we are now living in the last stage of God's redemptive plan. Uh, Jesus has come, he has risen, and one day he will return, and that could be at any moment. And so we need to live in light of that. So with the end in view, uh, Peter now urges his readers to do several things. Uh, First of all, as we see there in verse 7, we are to be alert and of sober mind. Why? Well, as he goes on to say, so that we are in the right frame of mind to pray. We've got to think straight if we're going to live right. Uh, Jesus himself, he prayed when his own end was near, didn't he? And we are to follow in his footsteps. What does a person do if they're not yet a Christian when they face difficulty and suffering in their lives? Well, more often than not, they go back to, to verse 3, don't they? they? They try and drown their sorrows. But what is the Christian's response when faced uh, with trouble? Well, it's to pray, isn't it? Prayer isn't a last resort. It's that first thing that we should do in our lives. And Jesus, he, he taught us how to pray with the end in mind. Our Father in heaven, he said, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Having an awareness of the end of what lies ahead should cause us, shouldn't it, to get down on our knees and pray for those who, who we know who aren't yet Christians It should cause us to to pray that Jesus would meet our own needs, that he would forgive our sins, and that he would help us to forgive others theirs. Because when we pray like that, it proves that we are both dependent and hopeful, that as exiles we know that we are on our way home. So the first thing to do is to, to pray, to be alert and of sober mind. And then secondly, with the end in view, we are to verse 8 love each other deeply. That's the change that the gospel uh, brings about in our lives. And Peter, he goes on to say, doesn't he, uh, that we are to to love each other deeply and that love covers over a multitude of sins. In other words, we're not to go around pointing out each other's faults all the time. That's not to say that we shouldn't confront one another from time to time and when necessary, but we're not to linger on past mistakes of others. We are to be ready and willing to forgive one another. So we are to love each other deeply whilst we wait. And thirdly, we can display that love for one another in practical ways too, as we see there in verse 9, by showing hospitality to one another. And then Peter adds, without grumbling. And he does that because if we grumble, then it indicates that Showing hospitality has become a bit of a duty for us. 
I suppose I have to kind of attitude. It's not actually an overflow of our love for those around us. And yet there's nothing like generous hospitality for increasing love within the church. I mean, it doesn't have to be Master Chef. It doesn't have to be the Great British Bake Off. Just a cup of tea and biscuits will do. In context, it's probably because many people in the early church uh, were being displaced and they had to travel to different places and cities and towns. And so they needed a meal and a, a place to stay the night. But just because we don't live in that kind of circumstance now, that's, that's not to stop us today. And we shouldn't wait to be asked to show hospitality either. Don't think, you know, no one else asked me round for tea. Instead, we are to be the one who asks others. And then finally, in verse 10, and right to the end of our passage, Peter goes on to encourage us to use all the other gifts that God has given us to serve one another whether it be those speaking gifts or those serving gifts or any of the other spiritual gifts that we read about in the New Testament. So with the end in sight, we are to look inwardly at ourselves in order to outwardly serve other people. And then lastly, Peter says, if we are to faithfully live in this world amongst all those pressures around us to conform to its ways, we are to to look backwards very briefly just turn back to verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4 therefore Peter says since Christ suffered in his body arm yourselves also with the same attitude because those who have suffered in their bodies have finished with sin In other words, as we suffer in this world, as we battle against that temptation to sin in our day-to-day lives, we need to look to Jesus. We need to focus on him. We need to consider what he went through in his own life and ultimately what he went through there at the cross in order to free us from that sin. I think this this passage, it raises an interesting question for us, doesn't it? What was Christ's attitude to sin? What was his attitude when they whipped him? when they drove those nails into his hands and feet, when he hung there on the cross for six whole hours. What was Christ's attitude then? His desire was that you and I be be released and set free of sin's grip on our lives. That's why he died. That's why he went to the cross. That's why he lived perfectly as he did. His attitude that was that he was done with sin, that he wanted to free us from its grip on our lives. That was Christ's attitude. So what's our attitude to sin in our daily lives? Peter says, arm yourselves with the same attitude as Christ. In this life, we are at war, aren't we, with sin and Satan. We're not at war with the world. As as, as Andy said uh, a few weeks ago, we're trying to win the world for Christ. But we may well receive some battle scars along the way from those who misunderstand perhaps what we're about and why we do and don't do what we do. But the knowledge that Jesus lived a holy life and died the most horrific death in order to set each one of us free, to buy us back from sin's grip on our lives, I think that should be the ultimate motivation for, for any of us that we need to steer well clear of sin and its effects in our lives and not go back to that old way of life. As verse 2 says, rather than living to fulfill our own petty desires and lusts, we are to live with a higher purpose in mind. We are to live the rest of our lives for the will of God. And you know, that's not boring. That's not old-fashioned. That's actually a real challenge, isn't it? And it's also a real adventure. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, we ask this morning that you would give us the courage uh, to go against the, the flow of this world, to stand up for what is right in and amongst our friends and our family and everyone else who is pressuring us perhaps to go back to our old ways. Lord, help us to take up our cross and follow you because of what you have done for us. In Jesus' name, and with his strength we pray. Amen.